Perhaps the greatest sin a king of the Middle Ages could commit was the act of dullness, at least when a king like Henry VI of England, who we see here in all his magnificence, at least when he proved to be a failure for his nation, he did it in interesting ways. Specifically for Henry, that was by losing the Hundred Years' War, and not by leading troops in great battles, but worse than that, through the gloriously disappointing act of just sort of giving up after his father, King Henry V, had taken more than half of France. Equally interesting at being a terrible king was Charles VI, who not only was the king who allowed Henry V to take half of France, but who spent the better part of his 42 years on the throne in the throes of mental illness. At times, Charles would forget who he and his family was. Other times, he would just fly into a fevered rage and suddenly start trying to kill his advisors. He also suffered from a thing called the glass delusion, which was a disorder that manifests in the Middle Age primarily among the wealthy, and in which he was convinced he was literally made of glass and could shatter at the slightest touch. But there's another terrible king of Western Europe that is rarely highlighted. John II of Castile, who we see here lying in repose uh, in his tomb in Burgos. Like Charles VI, John II spent an inordinate number of years dragging his country into a state of decline. But John II didn't take on this task in a spectacular way. Rather, he simply didn't do anything effective or particularly of note in his 40 years on the throne. In fact, the only really notable thing that John II seems to have done is fathered one of the great queens of Europe. Isabella I, who along with her husband Ferdinand II of Aragon, would go on to enact countless reforms of the government, oversee a succession war with Portugal, pursue the reconquest of Grenada, and of course fund exploration and trade missions such as that of Christopher Columbus. We see Isabella here as she is wont to be remembered um, when in fact she probably looked more like this. Of course, not even Isabella was without her faults, as it was under her reign that Jews were systematically expelled from the Iberian Peninsula with the beginning of what would become known as the Spanish Inquisition. But we'll talk more on that later. Hi, I'm Sean Sands from GamersWithJobs.com, and welcome back to our Let's Learn of Europa Universalis 4. This is episode 3. Uh, I mentioned John II of... Spain, not because he was a terribly interesting king, as I pointed out, he's he's really not. But uh, to be, sort of open up the conversation about the Iberian Peninsula down here, uh, and also to point out, interestingly, almost exactly as his reign ended, or even concurrent with the later half of his reign, uh, a John II rose in Aragon, son of Alphonse V. Uh, John II of Aragon was a much more interesting king. So for, for a little while, there were two John Seconds, or I guess two Johns II uh, on the thrones of Castile and Aragon. Um, John II of Aragon, while interesting, uh, spent most of his time actually in the holdings of Aragon in Italy. Uh, if you can see right here, uh, as we're looking at Aragon's diplomacy screen, they lead a personal union with Naples. I'll talk more about what that means uh, later, but it essentially means that Naples is a, a very large vassal of Aragon. So Aragon of the 15th century was interested in really taking over the Mediterranean and stretching out into Italy. And John II uh, spent more time over here uh, than over here. Of course, that all changes uh, in the long run with uh, Isabella and Ferdinand, uh, who really formed the backbone of what will later become Spain. Uh, but I, I mentioned Aragon at all because in the end of last episode, we had just uh, formed an alliance with them. Uh, and that really opens up the door for us talking a bit about the diplomacy system of Europa Universalis IV, which is what I'll probably spend most of this episode talking about. Uh, we'll be in the background still fi fighting the, uh, the finishing bits of the Hundred Years' War, uh, but we'll, we'll dive into to what often becomes the heart of an EU game, uh, diplomacy. So with that, let's learn. For this episode, I'm going to keep it playing fairly slow in the background. For anybody who happens to be watching this who's more comfortable with EU4, yes, 
I'm keeping it very slow right now to keep the pace pretty easy as I talk through the basic mechanics. Uh, I usually play uh, the game at speed setting three or four, depending on the pace. I'm not, I'm not a speed setting five kind of guy, uh, but that's just a uh, personal preference. But I'm going to have the, the end of the Hundred Years War going on in the background here as I begin to dig into the diplomacy. Uh, so we're just going to click this and let time catch back up and England can do whatever it's going to try and do to stop uh, stop France and, and my vassals from inevitably taking their holdings. Uh, but I wanted to spend more time here on, uh, like I say, the diplomatic side of EU4 because, like I say, that really becomes fundamental to most games. Managing your... Oh, he's going to try and come here and take back some of his lands. He's going to fail. Uh, like I say... Diplomacy forms the background of a lot of what you do in EU4, and so in many cases, understanding that is critical to understanding how to get somewhere in the game. If you right-click on any country, you can bring up their interface to do your basic diplomatic actions with. If you right-click your own country, you'll actually see your opinion. Uh, your, on the left here, your opinion of every country, and on the right, their opinion of you. Um, often there's some differentiation there. So, for example, Bosnia, who, for whatever reason, Bosnia is just not that happy with us right now. We see that they have a minus 10 um, view of us, and if you hover over, it'll tell you why. I'm about to lose that. Let's not lose that. Um, and on the bottom part, let's go back to Bosnia there. You can see that we, we're pretty happy with Bosnia. We like them. A plus, I mean, zero is really your baseline, and it can go plus or minus 100 in most cases. Uh, or, put, no, plus 200. I think it's only minus 100. I'm not totally sure on that. Uh, if you're minus two, it may be minus 200. If you're minus 100 or worse, it doesn't really matter. They hate you, so you're dead to them either way. But what I, it, to get to this screen, you just right-click on any particular country, and these all expand into a wealth of additional options. And I should point out, I do have a mod that I'm using here which expands this screen. I just I find it very useful just to see more of it. And this is one of those things in a U4 where it can get really sort of overbearing, like how will I ever know what all this does? How will it matter? How will I possibly use this? Uh, and for the most part, there's just two or three that are really, really key to your, your, your usefulness. Um, offering an alliance, starting a royal marriage, uh, fabricating a claim, improving relations. Those are really your most important ones, and they sort of define most of what you're going to be doing uh, with or against other countries. Fabricating a claim is how you get what's called the casus belli on other countries, which allows you to go to war with them. Uh, other things like offering an alliance and a royal marriage, and obviously improving relations helps you build your, your network. I should point out here that I actually have too many diplomatic relations uh, for, uh, for, for my nation. Depending on your tech and your, your ideas and, 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 and who you're playing as and a number of uh, factors, you have a certain number of relationships that you can have. Ah, I see here one of them. I'm guaranteeing Scotland. I don't want to do that anymore. So I'm just going to revoke guarantee. So all of these things, except for uh, obviously improving relations, a lot of these things take up a diplomatic, uh, a diplomatic uh, relations slot. And are you going to come down? Come on, come on, you can do it. Uh, and then how you manage these, in my case, six diplomatic relations really fundamentally uh, determines how you're managing your overall diplomacy. I've made the choice to, uh, if you see at the bottom, set up a royal marriage and alliance with Aragon down here. And one of the things I'm going to do now, since I've set up this alliance and, you know, this, this marriage, I'm going to go ahead and improve relations with them. We, if they're going to, we want them on our side, we want them all the way on our side. Uh, the reason I did that, by the way, is because I noticed that Castile had rivaled me. On any of these 
nations, you can see a little symbol next to them for how they feel about you in general. Uh, this is independent of this number right here. So, um, for example, let's go back to Bosnia again. You can see they're minus 10 with us right now, but they have this heart right here, which means they're inclined to be friendly with us. They want to like us. Just We just need to give them a reason. Um, by comparison, for most of the game, Burgundy, if not all the game, should Burgundy survive, uh, will have us probably as a rival, which means no matter pretty much how good I get up my relationship with them, it's never going to matter. They're always going to seek to destroy us and ruin us and make us unhappy. Um, and I noticed that Spain had done that as well. If you right click on your own nation, you can actually see all the nations who have rivaled you. So it's it's a who's who of Europe. England rivaled us. Bergen, so let's see, England, just for fun. England rivaled us, we're at war with them. Uh, Burgundy rivaled us. Austria, the head of the Holy Roman Empire rivaled us. Uh, and Castile rivaled us. So we need some friends, basically basically is the story here uh don't have a lot of opportunity to 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 waste time on um being overly picky aragon is right on our border as is burgundy as is uh very close uh austria as is very close uh spain we only have this small buffer of tiny navarra which will almost certainly get annexed by spain any day now Ooh, we have one that siege, so we can pull them out. We're about to win this siege, and then we'll probably let the, the, the war go on a little longer. Hopefully one of my vassals will gain a pause, will gain some um, uh, access through Burgundy here so they can go capture Calais. Uh, let's see, a couple of things happening here. Nobles ally with foreign powers. The nobility was not fully subjugated during this age, and nobles could and did strike independent alliances with foreign princes. The crowns of Europe might not have liked it, but they were normally hard-pressed to prevent these kinds of activities. This is what we were talking about, actually, in a previous episode, where those independent provinces and independent nobles would often uh, start their own internal conflicts. Uh, while it probably won't show up in the game, Armagnac is almost is is historically a thorn in France's side during this time. You know, occasionally partnering up with some great power, even just uh, internally to go try and uh, you know strike out at France and improve their own standing. Uh, so this is pretty accurate. This is something that definitely happened. Uh, these these pop up from time to time randomly. These kind of mini events, and they almost always have two to three options here uh almost never an easy option if you you know even even if you know exactly what you're looking for and exactly what it uh, what the impact is they're almost never easy if you hover over the options you see i have choice of either saying something really mean like they will pay for their treachery uh which will lose me administrative power up here, which I mentioned in the last episode, I really like administrative power. I want to get those first few administrative technologies. So losing uh, almost, I, I can't do math, almost a lot of that 169 uh, is not something I'm inclined to do. Um, and, but France does gain an impl diplomatic insult, cast a spell eye on Brittany. So it would allow me to go to war with Brittany if I wanted to, which really I'm probably not going to do right now. So um, we'll deal with them later. Loses prestige. Uh, of our 26 prestige, it would lose me 25. So my prestige would go down to one. Um, you also may remember that we took a mission last time, which was to have a prestige of at least 50. Obviously, 25 in the other direction is not preferred. I'm going to take the administrative power hit just because I really don't want to lose prestige right now the reason for that is actually because as i mentioned fighting wars winning wars winning uh, uh sieges closing out wars is what's going to get us prestige uh, and it's going to be a tough climb to get to 50 right now anyway uh, so the administrative power or will will come back and we'll be able to replace that in uh about about five four or five months again math not not great uh, so we've immediately gotten that cast a spell eye, that diplomatic insult, cast a spell eye against Brittany because they have insulted us. Um, and while we could show those insulting dogs superiority, uh, we just won't because we're beneficent. And 
um, also because we got better things to do. Meanwhile, we also now have a Caspelle against our rival, Castile. Castile has started a trade dispute with us. This means they've embargoed our trade ships um, probably in the, uh, the Bordeaux region here, uh, I suspect. I'm not sure. Um, and so maybe, no, nope, we don't have one down here in uh, uh, Sevilla. Uh, so they're they're just messing with our trade. That's another reason we could go to war with them. Uh, but again, we won't because we have a lot better things to do right now. So I'm unpausing the game and back to diplomacy. Let's talk about rivals for a minute because I think I probably need to rival some people as well. Uh, the benefit. Oh, here comes England. No England. No. No. Yeah, Henry the Sixth never even tried that hard. So I think, I think we'll just kind of toy with them for a while here. Um, I'm going to set England as a rival. You can see here the benefits of a rival. You get better prestige uh, uh, by defeating them in battle. Normally, I actually would have automatically rivaled England, but it didn't because I wanted to talk about it. So we probably lost a little uh, prestige there. Um, there's, if I want to embargo uh, the, my, my rivals, then I don't take a penalty. I get better spy offense against them, which means I can um, most of the time fabricate claims faster on them. Uh, and of course, uh, diplomatic power cost for demanding provinces from them in a peace deal is less, which will be relevant very, very soon. So I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and, and rival them. I'm gonna do the same to Burgundy. Uh, it's probably pointless, but I'm going to hold out possible hope for someday convincing Austria they shouldn't be as angry with us as they are. So the diplomacy mechanics of EU4 is really that back and forth management of um, of who's how others are diplomatically interacting with you, whether they're in, you know impacting your trade, uh, whether you're having diplomatic uh, conflicts with them, whether you become Good, good friends. You may have noticed this started at plus 88, and now it's plus 105. If you hover over the number, you can see the things that are positively influencing it. Um, you may notice here, in it, one of these is enemy of enemy, plus one per month. Uh, if you right-click on them, we can actually see what uh, other countries are rivaling. Uh, so we know they're rivaling Castile, Hungary, and Venice. Why am I getting enemy of enemy then? I'm not anymore. Okay, so they probably had a rival of either Burgundy or England, uh, and uh, they took that off to replace it probably with Venice I'm, or, or Hungary. I'm not sure which. Um, so, you know, managing these things. Oh, whoa. All right. Well, Louis the 11th is on the throne now. So Charles the 7th. Uh, Yep, Charles VII died a lot earlier than he was supposed to. Uh, I will have to check here in a second when, when Charles VII actually died, but there was a, a whole series of history in which Louis XI, very famously, uh, was in conflict with his father. He rose up against him. Uh, Charles VII put him in exile uh, as he was waiting to come to the throne, um, and none of that will have happened here because Louis XI de Valois is now the glorious ruler of our nation. He's a 432 king. Um, and as is pretty typical, I think it always happens, uh, when, a, when a king dies and a new king comes to the throne, you take a stability hit, uh, which to fix, and I'll explain later why I'm fixing it, I have to actually spend more of my precious administrative power to boost my stability back up, and now I'm down to 71, even though I wanted to get that up to around four, four or 500. Um, Oh, 568 to get my next tack. Uh, I've lost well over 100 in just the time we've been playing here for a few minutes. So Louis XI de Valois now on the throne. He is 23 years of age. He has an heir, uh, Joan de Valois, uh, who is a 425. So we're getting some pretty decent roles on these kings These as, as it moves through uh, history. I think these... Uh, these actually are, are, are randomly generated uh, 
I, I'm not sure what the mechanic is, whether there's some historical context, but I, I've often gotten, you know, errors that would be a 1-1-1 in, in the next game, uh, you know, a 5-5-6 five, five, or something like that. We see here that nine pretender regiments are going to revolt and bury. This complicates our Hundred Years War. Uh, because now all of a sudden we may, are probably going to have periodic, uh, at least until Louis is really established on the throne, periodic pretender re regiments showing up and causing us trouble. So we know they're going to show up and bury. I'll go ahead and start moving that way. I'll take the hit. Now I could have played with the mechanics there a bit, and I may later on, but just for now I'm not going to do anything tricky. Uh, and we'll start time back up. You can see down here the English are probably going to, are sending just not enough troops at all to do anything of use. Uh, so we'll go down there and beat them up after we destroy these pretenders in Barry. So manageable, it's it's nothing you know big and scary. It's more a headache uh, as opposed to anything else. The death of, of our king um, probably won't slow us down as far as the Hundred Years War go. Okay, so we finished Suzy Co. We won that one. You can see here that one of our vassals, Bourbonnet, is sieging Calais. Uh, Burgundy's saying mean things to me, as they want to do. Things are going pretty predictably at this point. Talking more about the diplomacy, a good way to get an understanding of everything that's really going on in your neck of the woods is, is to right-click and get to this, or, or click, up, click up here. Just go to this diplomacy screen and you get a real sense overall of the different re relationships you have um not just the, the the all the ones you don't care about but this is much more likely the ones you actually do care about so you'll see different uh, symbols and they will say what those symbols are you can see i'm at war with england uh, i'm winning because this number is green um if it was red minus 41 i would be losing and that would be bad uh, you can see that I, as I did a few minutes ago, I'm actually, I am improving my relations with Aragon. Uh, a ton of places are trying to improve their relations with us. So these are all the nations that are out there and have sent diplomats to France to try to try to make nice. Um, France is a powerhouse. A lot of countries are going to want us to be nice to them, uh, particularly a lot of the smaller ones. So Liège, uh, Utrecht, uh, which is right here. Um, Friesland. Oh, I'm not going to get Friesland. Somewhere over here, it's in the HRE. Uh, Genoa is down here, and also bizarrely, here in Crimea. These these smaller nations are trying to get our uh, our attention and 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 our our, our patience and our not bullets. Uh, we can see who we're allied with. We're allied with Aragon. We have a royal marriage with Aragon. We have five vassals. You may have noticed up here when I was showing you all my diplomatic relations, all but one is being taken up by my vassals. So it's great that I can have those vassals and they do provide me a good bit of money, uh, but they do prevent me from having more relationships with other outside nations. This is who all uh, everybody have a Cassus Belli on. So this is everybody I can go to war with and why. Um, and I'm being embargoed by my good friends in England burgundy and castile i have the mission improve our prestige which we know about so that's a re i mean it's a really useful screen if you find yourself kind of playing along and you're like oh, oh gosh um who can i go to war with i feel i feel like starting a war who can i go to war with uh, you can get to that right here and find it out really easily um you can also really get a sense of uh the different who who's reaching out to you who this is usually a good sign if somebody is improving relations with you they probably want to open a diplomatic channel with you you probably won't see in here for example castile or england or burgundy or austria because they've they've made their position pretty clear it's these other countries who are still on the fence i mean or uh in this case is friendly with us um Savoy, understandably, feels threatened. That's actually usually a point in your favor. It gives you more leverage over them. Yes, because I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to kill five thousand more guys. You can see that we have essentially at this point won the Hundred Years' War. So why am I not just kicking in uh, a peace deal now, get this over with, and get back to playing the game? And the reason why is that. 
eventually, particularly if you've if you've put yourself in a good position, the longer you drag out the war against a defeated enemy, the more concessions you're able to get from them. So I'm probably going to let this go uh, for another few years. I'm going to click this button right here. I could have also clicked it um, in here. Nope, I couldn't have. I thought I could. All right. So I'm wrong about that one. I click this button right here, and it gives me an overview of the war. You can see all the countries on my side, and along with all my vassals, prim again, primarily vassals, uh, Lorraine, which is here, is in the war. That's not a vassal. It's part of the HRE. Uh, and Provence, which isn't a vassal, but kind of should be. Uh, you can see them over here, and they also have the main area of Provence down here. Is also in the war. England is on its own. Its war goal is to take my capital. That's not looking, you know, likely at this point. And you can see all the battles we've won or lost. This is the current war score. Uh, I get an advantage because I control the war goal, which is Paris, essentially. Uh, it's in the province de France, but this is Paris right here. You can actually tell uh, this crown on top of a spike. Uh, it shows you the capital of any um, nation. I think they're down here. Yep. So if you need to quickly see where the capital is, uh, you can actually get a good visual glimpse of that. Obviously, London as well. We can begin to see uh, what concessions we will get right now. Um, I would like to take as much of this back as I can. A couple of reasons for that, um, just being... You know, it's a good power play. These are these are good, uh, rich provinces with, well, not that one, a, a high tax rate, which means I'll make a lot of money off of them. Uh, I no reason to keep England on the mainland as much as possible. While we probably won't get Calais out of the deal, uh, it's, it's I, I just like to go ahead and secure up as much as I possibly can. Uh, and because these are considered French cores, they're considered a main... Uh, part of, of France, um, we won't take a penalty for trying to claim it. If you go in and you fabricate a claim on, say, Cambrai, uh, I may be able to have a claim against it, but it's not a core. It's not, I, you know, I don't, even though I can say, you know, there's a good reason why Cambrai belongs to France. It's because I want it really a lot. Um, that doesn't, that doesn't make it a legitimate core, and so there's there's a cost associated when you when you take that as a war goal. Uh, all of these, including Calais, are considered cores of France. So you'll see in here that while it does have a cost from a uh, peace value, in other words, I have a war score of 54. Each of these is about how much it's going to cost me of that 54 to get them to give it to me. Uh, usually over here in over extinction over extinction over extension uh, you have a number which says okay you've taken part of the realm which is not yours you're going to have to core it which is going to cost you both administrative points and while you're coring it it's going to cost you uh, essentially essentially some stability uh, you don't get as much trade you don't bring in as much taxes your country is considered slightly to very overextended um, so you have to be very careful about what you take in peace treaties for that reason. You can't just say, ha ha, I have everything. I've, I've, I've laid siege to all of Burgundy. I shall absorb it as once. Your, your nation would simply fall apart. It just isn't, uh, the, the mechanics of the game aren't built that way. So let's say I wanted to take everything. Calais, Co, and Gascony, and Laborde, and Normandy. I'm going to need to get to something like 75 war score to get anywhere near that. I'm about 20 short. It's probably not likely that I'll get there. I don't think I'll try to get there. But if I just went for the four here on, uh, uh, you know, that, that really just fit in nicely into France instead of getting this one that's sort of segmented away from us and now we have to worry about Burgundy more, uh, it's going to cost me 63. We're close to that, but it's going to take a little time uh, for this score to slowly, slowly increase. And you can see now Defender Controls Ile de France is giving me 15 as opposed to 13 when we looked a moment ago. So it's going up slowly, and it's really not hurting me to just sit here and, and let, the, let, the, let the time tick out on the clock. Um, yes, my, my ports are essentially blockaded. I can't get 
uh, my trade ships out to start doing trade. Um, but it's fine. I don't the the pretender rebels. I don't seem to be a problem. I you know I crushed one and gone. Uh, it makes sense because this is legitimacy. Is how steady is the king on the throne? He's ninety five out of a top score of a hundred, so he's seen as very very legitimate. Um, if the heir had a claim that was uh, average or weak uh, when they took the throne, you'd see that legitimacy score a lot lower, uh, and you'd probably see a lot more. Uh, pretender regiments rising up in opposition. So things are going pretty well here. Um, I'm not doing a lot of managing uh, the, the, the diplomacy, but one of the things I want to go ahead and start doing is thinking about annexing my vassals. Uh, so annexing my vassals is, annexing vassals is something you can do after having them for five years, I want to say. So after you take a Vassal, I think it's five, it may be ten. Uh, in fact, now I'm thinking it's ten. Ten years later, you can annex them if you're not at war and if they have a hundred and ninety uh, opinion of you. So uh, we got to start boosting this up. And I think, let's see, who do I want first? I want I want high high tax value provinces. So Bor that's Orleans. Bourbonnais, he only has a five and only a five. Auvergne, nope. No oh, thanks, Auvergne. You're last. Uh, Armagnac has a three and a five, so that essentially equals an eight. Uh, Foch only has a four. So we're going to, even though it's only one, we're going to focus on Orleans up here, which makes sense to some degree, considering the history of the Orle uh, Orleanist support of the French throne uh, during the mad reign of King Charles VI. Uh, so we're going to start improving relations with him. We want to get this number uh, up to 190. Well, let's see what's going on here. Sale of titles. My lord, one of your advisors has suggested selling off titles of nobility to anyone who can afford to pay. It would bring in lots of money if we do, but it would devalue the idea of nobility and perhaps upset the existing aristocratic families. Should we do this? So I can either get 45 ducats I'm pretty good on ducats right now. I'm not. I'm not in much trouble from an economy standpoint, and I have a good flow coming in. Or I, the stability. Stability is worth so much to me. I, I don't know. Uh, stability just influences everything in the game, and it can be any number from minus three to plus three. Uh, it's pretty common. There are lots of things that take your stability down. Uh, if you declare war on a, you know, a country you have a good relationship with, uh, if you end a marriage and you're not uh, the head of the Curia, uh, if you're not the Curia controller, we'll get to the Holy See later, um, just random events, uh, the death of a king. So any chance, almost any chance I get to raise stability, I will go with that unless I have a really, really strong reason not to. So nobility cannot be bought. It's insane. Give me that stability. And we can see here, um, things are going pretty well for France. Uh, we have our partnership with Aragon. Um, I'm going to go in here and get a marriage uh, when I can here in just a few days so that we can get into position to annex Orleans here and have a nice eight tax province, bringing in even, even more money for France. Uh, and you know, while we have some pretty strong adversaries the reality is is that france is actually in a very strong position itself um, there's lots of countries who do want to be our friend as we begin to annexing we'll actually be able to develop more uh, relationships and more alliances with other countries um, securing our position as what will become the powerhouse of uh, western europe so oh i have no diplomats all right well we'll have to take that in the next episode uh, where I think we will officially close out the Hundred Years' War. We'll secure our holdings here in the north of France uh, in, and in Aquitaine, and we will start building uh, a nation to uh, crush our enemies, which, you know, that's the whole point. So again, I've been Sean Sands from GamersWithJobs.com, and I appreciate you uh, stopping by and, and enjoying this Let's Learn, Let's Play. Um, you know, I, I don't like to say it too much, but obviously if you want to leave a like, that would be hugely appreciated uh, and certainly would help me keep going uh, with this uh, 
with this series. But until next time, take care. <laughs>